What's value investing? Value investing is an investment strategy in which an investor seeks to identify and buy securities that sell well below their intrinsic value. In other words, the value investor looks to purchase securities that trade or sell at a large discount compared to what they are really worth. That discount is referred to as margin of safety by the value investing community. The value investing methodology was developed in the 1920s by professors Benjamin Graham and David Dodd, both teachers at Columbia Business School at the time. In 1934, they revealed their principles in their book titled Security Analysis. Almost 90 years later, the book is still popular and considered the value investor's bible. Security analysis established the framework on how to analyze and value companies using a fundamental analysis approach. Unlike many of the get-rich-quick strategies and courses taught and pushed on consumers today, value investing stresses a buy-and-hold strategy of owning securities for the long term. It's not uncommon for some value investors to own shares in companies for 20 years or more. There have been numerous studies among academics investigating the effectiveness of buying value stocks. And those studies have consistently concluded that value stocks outperform other investment strategies and the overall market over the long term. For example, according to research conducted by Bank of America, since 1926, value investing has returned 1,344,600% compared to 626,600% for growth investing. Most of the world's most successful investors, living or deceased, are or were value investors. There are many notable value investors, but the most well-known is Warren Buffett, who was a student of Benjamin Graham while attending Columbia Business School. Some other famous value investors are Charlie Munger, Seth Klarman, Mario Gabelli, Walter Schloss, deceased, Irving Kahn, deceased, William J. Ruane, deceased, and John Templeton, deceased. Is value investing dead? It's easy to search the internet and find numerous articles declaring that value investing is dead. Wow, is value investing really dead? No, of course, if I believed that ridiculous notion, I wouldn't have bothered writing this book. So why are so many investment pundits saying that value investing's dead? In 2020, Bank of America declared value investing dead and pointed to the fact that value stocks experienced their worst decade on record relative to the performance of growth stocks. The environment over the last decade truly has not been favorable to the value investing strategy. Value stocks usually perform well during market downturns and were expected to do so as a result of the recession caused by the COVID-19 epidemic. But the reality is that the expected performance did not materialize. Now here's what I think many of those that have written off value investing fail to realize. The value investing strategy is for the long-term investor. And, as with other investment strategies, there's going to be periods of underperformance. Even the world's most successful value investors have admitted there will be long periods where value investing will underperform the market as a whole. Another important element that I think is negatively influencing the performance of value investing is that many of those claiming to be value investors really are not, but will purchase what they perceive to be value stocks, then sell them at the first sign of a troubling event. Although my assessment may be incorrect, I highly doubt it. I believe many self-proclaimed value investors are short-term oriented, who fail to invest in high-quality companies and then fail to stick with a value investing strategy long-term. According to Morningstar, in 2020, the gap in performance between growth stocks and value stocks was the widest it has ever been. Some experts believe that the underperformance of value stocks has resulted from the overperformance of growth stocks. From my observations during the last several years, growth stocks have been trading at absurd valuations in relation to their earnings and revenue growth. I think this is still true as I write this chapter. 
hardcore and experienced value investors will not purchase stocks that trade at what they view as ridiculously high prices in comparison to the company's future growth prospects. That particular mindset is what makes them value investors. It seems to me some investment critics tend to forget about something known as mean reversion or reversion to the mean. With mean reversion, history has shown that stocks whose prices have strayed far from their long-term norms will eventually return to those norms. I think that this is especially true for many growth stocks that have gotten ahead of themselves in price. I believe that if we identify and invest in those high-quality value stocks, trading at discounts in comparison to their fair values, and we have the patience to allow the value investing strategy to work, we will do quite well over the long term. The value investing strategy has proven to be a highly effective wealth creator for the patient investor. 10 Important Rules of Value Investing There are certain rules or principles that should be adhered to in order to obtain the greatest benefits from the use of the value investing strategy. Now, of course, the 10 rules provided are not etched in stone. In time and with experience, the intelligent investor will discover other rules or principles that will help him or her become an even better value investor. Growing in knowledge and skills should be a priority of every investor, regardless of the investment style or strategy being used. Here are the 10 rules. Starting with rule number one, only invest in businesses you understand. Peter Lynch considered one of the greatest investors to have ever lived, stresses the importance of investing in what you know. In other words, he thinks that we should only invest in businesses that we understand. If we were buying a local business, we would probably look for one that we already have a good understanding of and would more than likely avoid buying any business that's too hard to understand. Warren Buffett refers to this action as staying within your circle of competence. In other words, if you don't understand a business or understand how it works, you shouldn't purchase its stock. The world's most successful investors have revealed that those easy-to-understand, boring businesses are the ones that tend to do very well for their investors. Furthermore, if we're investing in businesses that we understand, we're more than likely to stick with them when things are not going as expected or the businesses are not performing well. Rule number two. Always invest with a margin of safety. Margin of safety is one of the most important, if not the most important, metric of value investing. I define margin of safety as the difference between a stock's market price and its fair value. For example, if a stock's current market price is $65 per share and its fair value $90 per share, the stock has a margin of safety of $25, or about 27.8% per share. The formula for determining margin of safety is intrinsic value per share minus stock price divided by intrinsic value per share. Rule number three, think like a business owner. If you're investing in stocks, you need to think like a business owner because in reality, you are one. When you think like a business owner, it puts you in the right frame of mind needed to succeed in value investing. For example, consider local businesses in your area. Does a local business owner buy a business today, then turn around and sell that business tomorrow? Of course not. But some investors will buy and sell shares of a stock that they've owned for only a short period of time in an effort to make a quick profit. For the value investor who invests in high-quality businesses, that type of buying and selling would be a big mistake, since high-quality businesses have the possibility of providing returns of several thousand percentages over the long term. Rule number four, invest for the long term. Investing for the long term is the intelligent thing to do when using a value investing strategy. Holding stocks for the long term is the most effective way to maximize your returns because high-quality businesses' earnings will usually increase dramatically over the long term. Increased earnings are the main driving force to a stock significantly increasing in price. If the stock pays dividends, the dividends are likely to increase consistently too. 
Rule number five, do your own homework. I have heard several famous investors say that most people will spend more time researching an appliance for their home than a stock that they want to buy. Those same people won't hesitate to put thousands of dollars into some investment that they've done little to no research on. It's foolish to invest your money into stocks or other investments without doing your own research. It's all right to listen to others, but it's up to you to determine if the information provided is useful. The intelligent investor is the one that always does his or her homework before investing money into anything, including stocks. Rule number six, don't follow the crowd. I have recently watched in amazement as GameStop skyrocketed in price almost daily, moving from a low of $17.25 per share at the beginning of 2021 and climbing to a high of more than $500 per share before the close of the month. Now, I'd researched GameStop on several occasions and never liked the stock. As a matter of fact, I still don't like the business, and until recently, I had no idea why others pushed the stock's price to such exorbitant highs. As the price begins to rise, and others begin to hear about the stock, they wanted in on the action, and without hesitation or research, started buying the stock too. This action is commonly referred to as having the herd mentality, or following the crowd. When you invest, it is never a good idea to follow the crowd. If you follow the crowd, expect the same results as the crowd. History has shown that those investors that think for themselves and refuse to follow the crowd tend to do much better than the crowd when it comes to the performance of their investment portfolios. Today, GameStop closed at about $158 per share. I'm willing to bet that a lot of investors have lost money investing in the stock, even though it's still up dramatically. Rule number seven, keep some cash in reserve. Always keep some cash in reserve. There's nothing wrong with being fully invested, meaning that you have 100% of your cash tied up in investments, especially if the money is invested in the stocks of high-quality companies. On the same token, it's good to have some of your portfolio in cash for those deals that come along that are almost too good to be true, because they will come along every now and then. By keeping a percentage of your portfolio in cash, it keeps you from having to sell something else in your portfolio to obtain the needed cash. Rule number eight, keep your emotions out of the market. One of the worst things that you can do as an investor is to invest based on your emotions or your feelings. The stock market or stocks do not care about your feelings. If you feel good about a stock, that won't keep it from falling in price. And if you feel bad about a stock, that won't keep it from climbing in price. So never make an investment decision that's based on your feelings, because it will probably be the wrong decision. Stick to the facts before buying or selling a stock. The emotions of most of the investors in the market are the cause of a lot of the stock market's volatility. But usually, when the underlying factors are checked, generally nothing notable has happened in the market that warrants its volatility. Rule number nine, invest in high-quality companies. Although value investors are looking to buy stocks that are selling at bargain prices, Another important element of the value investing strategy explained in this guide is that you invest only in the stocks of high-quality companies. When we own stocks, their trading prices are going to fluctuate, and that's just a fact. Those fluctuations in price are subject to go higher or lower, and there's nothing we can do to control that. As value investors, we should be investing in high-quality companies that are more likely to perform very well over the long term. When those companies perform well, their stocks tend to perform well by dramatically increasing in price over the long term. If we invest in lousy companies, there's a very good chance that their stocks are going to perform lousy too, especially over the long term. What investor in his or her right mind wants to own a lousy company anyway? Just the fact of knowing that we own high-quality companies will make it much easier to stay with our game plan when things are not going well. Stick to investing in the stocks of high-quality companies if you want to succeed long-term in the stock market. 
And finally, rule number 10, be patient. If there's something that gets into the way of most people that fail at investing in stocks, it's a lack of patience. The majority of people that invest in stocks do so with the intention of making some fast money or getting rich quickly. But that mindset usually results in most of them losing money. Warren Buffett has stated, quote, The stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. I choose to be the patient investor because that's where the key to building real wealth lies. These 10 rules that have been provided are a good start to a solid foundation as a value investor. So learn and apply them if you're serious in your effort to become a very successful value investor. How to make money while you sleep. Many years ago, I remember hearing a report on television that told how much money basketball legend Michael Jordan was making while he slept. Of course, the large amount that was reported fascinated me at the time, and I thought to myself how wonderful it would be to make money while I slept. Imagine going to bed at night and waking up the next morning with more money in your account than you had the night before. Wouldn't that be nice? The truth is that owning stocks that pay dividends is about the closest most of us will come to that realization. Although we don't receive daily payments, we can expect to receive quarterly payments at least four times yearly. And if the company distributes dividends monthly, we can expect to receive payments from it 12 times a year. When we take into consideration the capital gains that we obtain with our stocks in addition to the dividends, our stocks will actually work for us 24 hours a day and 7 days a week as long as we own them. They will continue to consistently spew money into our investment accounts regardless of whether we are asleep or awake. Warren Buffett stated, quote, If you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. To put it simply, Buffett was saying, even when you're asleep, your money should be working for you. The reinvesting of all profits that are earned from investing results in your money growing exponentially. This growth is known as compound growth. Compound growth allows an investor to take a small sum of money and in time become extremely wealthy. It has been called the eighth wonder of the world. If a person bought just 10 shares of Berkshire stock for a mere $300 or less in the late 60s once Buffett was at the helm, he or she would be a millionaire now from that small investment. At the time of this writing, those same 10 shares are worth $4.9 million. It doesn't take a lot of money for you to achieve great wealth. It's just important that you get started investing now and let the power of compounding work for you. Had you invested $10,000 in the S&P 500 index in January of 1990, that investment would be worth roughly $92,000 right now. Throw in the dividends that were received and reinvested, and that investment would be worth a whopping $180,000, or double the return from capital gains alone. Every time you reinvest dividends that you receive, it entitles you to larger future dividend payments, producing a snowball effect and turbocharging your future returns. You want to make the dividend reinvesting process automatic, meaning once dividends are received, the brokerage or account manager will automatically reinvest those dividends into more shares of the company paying the dividend. Today, most brokerages offer something known as a Dividend Reinvestment Program, or DRIP. In addition, most brokerages allow for the purchase of fractional shares. Until recently, it was uncommon, except in the mutual fund industry, to find brokerages that would allow for the purchase of fractional shares. The good news is that there are now many reputable brokerages that offer DRIPs, along with the ability for investors to purchase fractional shares of stocks and exchange-traded funds, or ETFs. Without the ability to purchase fractional shares, the investor would have to wait until he or she has enough funds in his or her account before being able to purchase stocks or other securities. For example, Let's say an investor contributes 10% of his base pay to his individual retirement account, or IRA, pre-tax. And the 10% amounts to $60 weekly, or about $240 monthly. 
The investor wants to build a position in iShares U.S. Medical Devices ETF, an exchange-traded fund that closed at a trading price of $318.63 at the time of writing this chapter. If the shares continue to trade at that price for the next few months, it will take the investor that contributes $60 weekly to his IRA about six weeks before he has enough funds available to purchase just one share of iShares U.S. Medical Devices ETF. As you can see, there is an advantage to being able to purchase fractional shares. I use TD Ameritrade and Merrill Edge for all of my investment accounts and think that both are great brokerages, but my use of them is certainly not an endorsement. Some other brokerages that offer dividend reinvestment programs along with the ability to purchase fractional shares are Vanguard, Charles Schwab, T. Rowe Price, and Fidelity Investments. No doubt there are also other reputable brokerages that also offer drips with the ability to purchase fractional shares. The choice of brokerage is up to you. Most brokerages do not charge a fee or commission to buy equities, which is a very recent change. Whether you buy one share or 100 shares, it'll cost you nothing. Now, that's a price that I love to pay. Investment Facts You Should Know When it comes to stock market investing, what you know or don't know can make or break you, literally. It's very important to know the facts when investing in stocks because not knowing the facts will likely lead to poor investment decisions and poor investment choices, which could lead to poor investment returns or losses. In this section, I address risk, stock market volatility, recessions, margin accounts, and stock splits, since it seems that many individual investors have the greatest misconception about these concepts and should have at least a basic understanding of them. So let's start with risk. There are very few investments that are completely free from risk because, frankly, all stock market investing carries some degree of risk. The main risk is the loss of your hard-earned money. So the next time someone tries to push some sort of risk-free investment on you, you should be very suspicious. Your goal as an investor should be to reduce risk as much as possible. This is not achieved by picking safe, conservative stocks, but by picking stocks of outstanding companies and buying those stocks at the right price, and selling them when it becomes necessary. Stock Market Volatility a stock's price may fluctuate greatly within a short period of time, even though nothing has fundamentally changed about the business. There are times when the stock market is calm, and there are times when it's very volatile. Volatility is a normal process in the functioning of the stock market, and should be expected. Stock market volatility is really a reflection of the investor's perception of what's going on with the economy. Successful investors understand that the stocks they buy may fall 50% or more in value, but they know not to panic and sell their shares in the process. Instead, they continue to focus on investing for the long term. Getting scared out of the market is what keeps most people from making any sizable returns. Recessions During recessions, most investors flee from stocks and move their money into what they consider safe havens, such as U.S. treasuries, high-grade bonds, money market accounts, and cash. What they fail to realize is that recessions and other economic woes are usually the best time to purchase stocks. Usually, at some point during a recession, most stocks will trade at prices far less than they are worth. I'm referring to their intrinsic value, or fair value, when I speak of worth. Not surprisingly, you may find stocks trading at just 20 to 25% of their intrinsic value. And when it comes to investment value, it does not get any better than finding deals like that. Margin Accounts a margin account is a credit line provided to you by your broker to use for investment purposes. The amount of the credit line is based on the value of your brokerage account. Most margin accounts allow you to have a credit line equal to the balance in your brokerage account. For example, let's say that you have $10,000 in your brokerage account. The margin account would usually allow you to purchase up to $20,000 in stocks, mutual funds, or other investments offered on the stock exchange. This is one time that you should not use OPM, or other people's money. 
never use a margin account for investing in the stock market. And my reason for recommending that you don't is a good one. Stocks are too volatile over the short term. With margin accounts, you can lose money even on excellent stock choices because even excellent stocks will tumble in price. My greatest capital losses were the result of foolishly using a margin account, so stay away from them. Even some of the world's best investors have gotten themselves into trouble through the use of margin accounts. And finally, stock splits. A stock split is the division of a share of stock into more shares that leaves the total value of the shares unchanged. For example, if a company announces that it has an upcoming two-for-one stock split for its shares, that means for every share that an investor owns, he or she will receive two new shares that replace the original share. In other words, 100 original shares become 200 new shares. Although the share price will change, the total value of the shares will not. When I was a novice and inexperienced with investing, I always chased after stocks that were about to split. The only thing a split does is lower the trading price of a stock. What really matters is the business itself and how it's performing. None of those stocks that split after my purchase performed any better after they split. Wall Street would have you believe that splits are important, but they really are not. So don't purchase stock splits, because doing so is just a waste of time, and you definitely won't get any richer from the process. The Intelligent Investor According to research, more than 90% of actively managed funds fail to outperform the returns of the overall stock market. When I first began doing my research into stock market investing for my first book many years ago, that figure was 75%. It's amazing how the tables have turned. Gary Kaminsky, author and successful Wall Street money manager, stated in his book Smarter Than the Street, quote, Taking personal control of your financial future makes more sense now than ever before. Additionally, he stated, quote, Research shows that in the last two-plus decades, the percentage of money managers that beat the S&P 500 is down by a significant margin over the percentage for the decades prior to 1987. Mutual funds, hedge funds, and other investment funds are the pooling of money from several individuals and or organizations into stocks, bonds, money market instruments, and a variety of other types of equities with the goal of earning a profit. The funds raise money for investment purposes from the issuance of fund shares. The individuals or teams managing those funds are experts in their fields who use very powerful and sometimes complex investment tools to assist them with investment decisions. Yet, most funds still fail to outperform the overall stock market. Now, if that's the case, then it would seem that the small investor does not stand a chance of investing successfully in the stock market. But that belief could not be further from the truth. Why do the fund managers and other money managers fail so badly at their job? Simply because most managers exert too much effort and energy into consistently being invested in stock trends. This is done in the hopes of obtaining a quick, large profit from the investment. Along with this investment strategy comes increased exposure to risk, because what's usually hot today won't be hot tomorrow. The small investor or individual investor must think long-term if he or she is going to achieve excellent returns from investing in stocks. Short-term investing in the stock market is just too risky. Although the stock market can be very volatile and unpredictable in the short term, it's much more predictable over the long term. The intelligent investor should purchase a stock with the intention of holding it no fewer than 10 years, according to Warren Buffett. In doing so, exposure to risk is decreased, and personal feelings and emotions are kept out of the market, allowing the small investor to be positioned for excellent future investment returns. It's also very important to take a non-traditional approach to investing. Don't do what everybody else is doing, and don't buy or sell a stock because everybody else is doing so. The most successful investors have been those that run to the stock market when everybody else is running from it. 
They buy stocks that everyone else is dumping and dump stocks that everyone else is buying. They are happiest when the stock market has been beaten down or when there's a big market correction or when panic selling is going on in the market. They know that during those times, the stocks of outstanding businesses can usually be purchased at a serious discount to their intrinsic or fair value. Remember, when pessimism is at its greatest, the most opportune times present themselves for making a lot of money by investing in stocks. In his book, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, Philip A. Fisher states, quote, The wise investor can profit if he can think independently of the crowd and reach the right answer when the majority of financial opinion is leaning the other way. Warren Buffett, the Sage of Omaha It is not uncommon for a superstar athlete or a box office smashing movie star to become a household name. It's extremely uncommon for an allocator of capital to accomplish such a feat. Warren Buffett is just the kind of uncommon individual to do just that. He is a household name who is greatly admired by people throughout the world and considered the most successful value investor in the world. Probably more than anyone, Buffett's success as an investor has brought worldwide popularity to value investing. Buffett has been branded the Sage of Omaha and the world's greatest investor. He is a philanthropist the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, and considered one of the most respected business leaders in the world. This global claim is not due solely to his wealth, but also to his great integrity and profound humility in both business and life. Warren Buffett was born on August 30th, 1930 in Omaha, Nebraska. Even at an early age, Buffett displayed a great interest in business and investing. As a child, he possessed an entrepreneurial spirit that was uncanny in such a young person. He sold drink bottles, chewing gum, and golf balls. He invested in pinball machines. At the age of 11, Buffett performed his first stock purchase, buying a few shares in City's Service Preferred, a public utility holding company in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, for himself and one of his sisters. While in high school, he bought a 40-acre farm with $1,200 of his savings. After graduating from high school, Buffett entered the Wharton School, the business school of the University of Pennsylvania. He studied there for two years before transferring to the University of Nebraska. He graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration at the age of 19. After being rejected for admission to Harvard Business School, perhaps on the basis that they felt that he was too young, Buffett applied the Columbia Business School at Columbia University. He earned a Master of Science in Economics from there in 1951. More importantly, it was at Columbia that he would gain the opportunity to study under the father of value investing, Benjamin Graham, who would become a mentor and friend to Buffett. The teachings of Graham would impact Buffett in ways that would change him forever. They would eventually lead Buffett on a path of success never seen in the investment world. From 1951 to 1954, Buffett worked at his father's business, Buffett Falcon Company. In 1954, he left to work at the Graham Newman Corporation, under the watchful eye of his mentor, Benjamin Graham. He was there until 1956. In 1956, Buffett started Buffett Associates LTD. Over the next five years, the partnership earned a 251% profit, compared with a total return of about 74% for the Dow Jones. With the partnerships prospering and Buffett producing amazing returns, it didn't take long for word to spread about this extraordinary money manager, a master at allocating capital. Buffett eventually ended up with more than 90 limited partners throughout the United States. He decided to merge the partnerships into a single entity, which he named Buffett Partnerships LTD. During the 10-year period after the formation of Buffett Partnerships Ltd., Buffett produced a total return of 1,156% for his investors, compared to a total return of 123% for the Dow Jones. In 1969, Buffett liquidated Buffett Partnerships Ltd. and issued shares of Berkshire Hathaway stock to the partners. 
In May of 1965, he named himself as director of Berkshire Hathaway. In 1970, he named himself as chairman of the board. In June of 2006, Buffett pledged to give away a significant portion of his wealth to charity, or 99% of his wealth to be more specific. Some estimates put Buffett's total charitable donations since his pledge at more than $46 billion. Charlie Munger, the right-hand man. He is known as Warren Buffett's right-hand man, Charlie Munger. Munger was born on January 1, 1924 in Omaha, Nebraska. He is a philanthropist, Warren Buffett's long-term friend and business partner, and vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway. Like Buffett, he's quick-witted, adored, admired, and loved by many, as well as being one of the world's greatest and most successful investors. Also like Buffett, he is known as a man of the highest integrity, both in business and life. Munger grew up in Omaha. He actually worked at Buffett & Son, a grocery store owned by Warren Buffett's grandfather, but it would be several years after his tenure there before he would meet Warren Buffett. Once they did meet, they were quick to establish a friendship that has lasted now for almost six decades. And that's an amazing feat in itself. Munger attended the University of Michigan from 1941 to 1943. He left to join the Army Air Corps during World War II. He later married Nancy Huggins, the daughter of Frederick and Edith Huggins, who owned and managed Huggins Shoe Store. Huggins graduated from South Pasadena High School and attended Scripps College and the University of California. After marrying, the couple moved to Boston so that Munger could attend Harvard Law School, where he graduated magna cum laude, though he had not obtained an undergraduate degree. After graduating from Harvard, he moved his family to California and went to work for the law firm of Wright and Garrett. In 1959, Munger's father passed away. This led him back to Omaha to help his family, and it was upon that return home that he met Warren Buffett. In 1962, Munger started Munger, Tolls, and Olson LLP, but he eventually gave up the practice of law to focus his time and energy on managing investments. In 1962, Munger partnered with Jack Wheeler to form the investment firm Wheeler, Munger & Company. The investment firm returned an average of 24.3% annually from 1962 to 1975. This amazing performance included heavy losses sustained by the firm in 1973 and 1974. Wheeler, Munger & Company was closed in 1976. In the 1970s, Munger and Buffett established an informal partnership. They invested together throughout the 1970s, and they have been an amazing tag team ever since. Investing Discipline – Temperament Famed value investor David Dreeman has stated, quote, It is one thing to have a powerful strategy, it's another to execute it. The very first thing recruits are taught when they arrive at Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, is the importance and the necessity of discipline. Discipline is instilled in the recruits throughout the entire basic training program to the point that its importance would be hard for any recruits to ever forget. Discipline is just that important for the day-to-day -day operations of the world's finest and fittest organization of fighting men and fighting women. During my basic training many, many years ago, the drill instructors would give the command zero to my platoon. In response to the command, all recruits were required to immediately cease what they were doing, regardless of the activity, and would become perfectly still. It did not matter if we were taking a shower, shining our boots, cleaning our weapon, or sitting on the toilet. We immediately froze in place and began to repeat the following statement in unison. Now, quoting... Sir, discipline is instant. Willing obedience to all orders. Respect for authority. Self-reliance and teamwork. Sir, freeze, sir. After completion of the statement, we remained completely still until we were given permission to move. Just as a great dedication to discipline is necessary during military service, it takes great discipline to obtain great success through stock investing. Throughout this section, I will refer to the discipline I'm talking about as investing discipline, or temperament. 
Now, before going any further, let's consider investing discipline for a moment. Investors who have investing discipline are able to stick to their investment plans and strategies regardless of the fear or chaos that exists in the stock market. As we would say in the military, they stay the course. You may have the world's best investment plan or program for building wealth, but it will be of little to no value to you if you lack the discipline needed to stick with it when things look bleak or hopeless. Markets go up and markets go down, but it's the disciplined investors that use both events to their advantage. The truth is, without investing discipline, there's a high probability of failure somewhere along the line. The world's best investment pros are head and shoulders above most other investors when it comes to remaining disciplined. Learning investment discipline is much like learning a new sport. Practice and repetition was my key to developing investing discipline, and I believe that the same would apply to most of you. After putting my investment plan into action, if I found myself straying from my plan, I would look it over again to remind myself what I should and shouldn't be doing. It's always important to keep in mind that the principles and strategies we're using were developed and proven by some of the world's most successful investors, and if we truly want them to work, we have to stay the course in good times and bad times. Every time I felt I was slipping in my discipline, I repeated the process. Remember, practice makes perfect. Here is a list of some of the most common mistakes undisciplined investors make, which must always be avoided by the disciplined investor. Attempting to predict or time the stock market. Failing to stick to an effective plan or strategy. Allowing fear and greed to control them. Having unrealistic expectations about their investments in the stock market. Lacking patience. Failing to do their own research. Investing with a short-term mentality. Focusing on trying to get rich quickly. Making investment decisions with their emotions. Acting on speculation about a company or business. Adopting a herd mentality by following the crowd. And failing to practice investment discipline. Now, although the list isn't long, it could have easily been much longer, but I believe you get the picture. Above all else, remember to practice, practice, and practice investing discipline. Invest as if you're buying the entire business. When you buy shares of a specific stock, each share of stock that you own entitles you to ownership of a small percentage of the business, and thereby a share in the profits or losses generated by that business. As a value investor, you must think and act like a business owner. But that process needs to start before you invest your money into any business or purchase its stock shares. No intelligent person would ever intentionally buy a business if there's nothing to be gained from its purchase. And I've never met anyone who invests in stocks that didn't want to make a profit. One way to determine whether or not the business is capable of generating enough income to make our purchase of it worthwhile is by determining what our initial rate of return would be if we were buying the entire business. We should be asking that question regardless of whether or not we can actually afford to purchase the business in its entirety. To be a successful investor, one needs to understand how to value a business. When we estimate the fair value of a stock, we're really attempting to value the business that issued the stock shares. Because we should be concerned with the overall performance of any business that's of interest to us, it makes perfect sense to estimate what our initial rate of return would be if we were buying the whole business. Why? Well, if the business isn't worth buying, we have no business buying even one share of its stock. There are only two numbers that I use to estimate the initial rate of return. They are the company's current market capitalization and its net income for the trailing 12 months, or TTM. Even if a company fails to increase its net income by a large margin for the current year, there's at least the possibility that its net income will closely match or exceed the net income for the trailing 12 months. Using the net income for the trailing 12 months is a kind of insurance policy for me. Let's look at a few examples of how to estimate the initial rate of return if we were buying the whole business. 
I've referenced some old financial reports to explain the process, so don't focus on the dates of the reports because that's really not important. Focus on the method that's explained instead. First, we will take a look at Amtrust Financial Services, Inc. According to a 2014 stock report for Amtrust Financial Services, its market capitalization stood at $2.91 billion, and its net income for the trailing 12 months was $345.6 million at the time of the report's preparation. To determine the initial rate of return on the purchase of Amtrust Financial Services, Inc., divide its net income, TTM, by its current market capitalization. So let's look at the example that follows. Again, net income TTM over market capitalization equals the initial rate of return. So $345.6 million over $2.91 billion equals an 11.8% initial rate of return. So if we bought the entire company of Amtrust Financial Services, Inc., we would have been expecting an initial rate of return of 11.8% or better from our investment if the business performed as expected. We will look next at Discovery Holdings Company, also known as Discovery Communications, Inc., a global nonfiction media and entertainment company. Upon looking at a 2013 stock report for Discovery Holdings Co., I found out that it carried a market capitalization of $18.8 billion, and its net income TTM was $954 million. Therefore, $954 million over $18.8 billion equals a 5% initial rate of return. So had we invested in Discovery Holding Co. at the time reported, we could have expected an initial rate of return of 5% or better if we bought the whole company and it performed as expected. Let's look at one last company using this method. And that company is Whole Foods Market Inc., which was bought by Amazon in 2017. Whole Foods Market sells natural and organic foods, and it's also a certified organic grocer. According to a 2014 stock report for Whole Foods Market, it had a market capitalization of $13.76 billion, and its net income, TTM, was $572 million. Therefore, $572 million over 13.76, that equals a 4.1% initial rate of return we would have been expecting an initial rate of return of 4.1% or better from our purchase of Whole Foods Market had we bought the whole company and it performed as expected. The process described in these previous examples is the one that I use to get an idea of the initial rate of return to expect if a specific business is purchased in its entirety. Now, although performing this calculation is not a necessity, I believe that its use will make it easier for us to identify and buy stocks when they're trading at very good values. And finding stocks trading at good values is very important for the value investor. When considering the initial rate of return, it's up to you to determine the minimum rate that's acceptable to you. I try to stick with businesses that offer an initial rate of return of 8% or higher. Concentrate your value stock portfolio. There have been innumerable discussions by well-qualified value investors concerning the number of stocks that a value investor should hold in his or her portfolio. Those discussions are of great importance since the number of stocks contained in an investor's portfolio usually plays an important role in portfolio performance and risk reduction. Believe it or not, the recommendation from most successful value investors has been that we keep our stock portfolios concentrated in the number of stocks contained in them. Dave Kansas, former editor-in-chief of TheStreet.com, has said that the ability to follow more than a dozen stocks is likely limited for most people. Peter Lynch, in his book Beating the Street, said that the part-time stock picker doesn't need 50 to 100 winning stocks— but could simply adhere to the rule of five, in which the investor limits his or her stock portfolio to just five stocks. In their book, Million Dollar Portfolio, The Motley Fool recommends that investors buy at least 12 stocks, and believes that 12 stocks would allow for greater diversification while providing a margin of safety against a few losers in the account. Even Warren Buffett, 
known as the world's greatest investor, believes that the ideal stock portfolio should contain no more than 10 stocks and that the investor should have the conviction to place at least 10% of his or her net worth in each of the 10 stocks. Robert Hagstrom, the author of The Warren Buffett Portfolio, has performed much research into portfolio management. In his book, The Warren Buffett Portfolio, he stressed the importance of running a concentrated portfolio and found that with a 15-stock portfolio, an investor has a 1 in 4 chance of beating the market. Agstrom discovered that when the portfolio contained 250 stocks, it had only a 1 in 50 chance of doing so. In conclusion, Based on my research of the investment strategies of some of the world's most successful investors, such as Philip A. Fisher, Warren Buffett, Seth Klarman, and others, the individual investor using the value investing strategy of buying high-quality companies would do well to limit their portfolios to a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 15 stocks. In doing so, they reduce investment risk while also improving their chances of beating the market. In addition, 10 to 15 stocks allow for a portfolio that's diversified, but it's not so large that an investor has a hard time monitoring the number of stocks in it. Now, if you haven't done so already, make sure to get your free gift as my way of thanking you for purchasing my book. Make sure to head back to the chapter called My Free Gift to get the specific link for five stocks that Warren Buffett would love. Fair Value Famed investor Philip Fisher stated, quote, The stock market is filled with individuals who know the price of everything but the value of nothing. If that statement applies to you, hopefully after you've finished reading and studying the information provided in this guide, that statement will no longer apply to you. Before the skilled value investor purchases any type of security, he or she will estimate its fair value. Without a fair value estimate, the value investor will not know whether the stock or security is selling at a discount in comparison to what it's really worth. Fair value is the price that an investor, group, or organization thinks a stock or business is worth, regardless of its current price. Simply put, it's an estimate, because if you were to ask 10 different and experienced investors to estimate the fair value of a specific business, you would probably get 10 different answers yet some of those investors' estimates would be close. I've experimented with several different valuation methods and have found that they all tend to assign different fair value estimates to the exact same stock being analyzed. This happens and is to be expected because different methods are going to yield different results. Even then, some of those methods give me a ballpark figure of what I should or should not pay for a specific stock. What's important is that you use a method that's effective and that actually makes money for you. It should also be a method that has the approval of several successful pros, is used by them, and has been used by them successfully over the long term. We must stay away from the numerous complex and confusing methods for valuing a stock because I don't think they're very helpful to the novice or beginning investor. Margin of Safety Margin of safety is at the core of value investing, and without it, value investing would no longer be value investing. It was professors Benjamin Graham and David Dodd who popularized the principle margin of safety. I have learned that margin of safety is one of the most important ingredients for investing successfully. And this is especially true with a value investing strategy. A margin of safety is the difference between a stock's market price and its fair value. Throughout my writings, I consider intrinsic value and fair value to be the same. And this is also the case throughout this guide. So just know that when I speak of fair value, I'm also referring to intrinsic value, so as not to confuse anyone, including myself. Since the fair value of a business is almost impossible to estimate with 100% accuracy, the lower the purchase price of the stock relative to its fair value estimates, the greater the margin of safety that exists and the safer the investment becomes. If an investor that implements a margin of safety during his or her analysis is accurate, there's the increased opportunity for above-average gains from the investment if it's purchased with a margin of safety. Let's look next at an example of how margin of safety works. Let's imagine for a moment that we've identified a high-quality value stock that we would like to purchase if the price is right. 
Upon completing an analysis, we have determined that the stock fair value is to be $12 per share. We've also decided that we will only purchase shares of a business when they're selling at a 25% discount relative to their fair value. The equation for determining our purchase price is as follows. Fair value times discount percentage equals the preferred discount in dollars. And then fair value minus discount equals the margin of safety purchase price. The margin of safety percentage you establish for your stock purchases is totally up to you. Throughout my research, I've found recommendations of anywhere from 10% to 50%. And I personally will only buy a stock when it can be purchased at a discount of 25% or more off its estimated fair value. So let's return to the example. We've determined that the stock's fair value is to be $12 per share. And we will only purchase shares when they're trading at a 25% discount in comparison to their fair value. So let's look again at the completed equation. $12 fair value times 0.25 discount percentage equals a $3 discount. Therefore, $12 fair value minus $3 discount equals a $9 margin of safety purchase price. Since we've determined the stock to have a fair value of $12 per share in the example, and we want to purchase the stock at a 25% or greater discount compared to its fair value, we will only purchase the stock when it's selling for $9 per share or less. From my many years of research, a commonality that I found among all the great value investors was that every one of them stressed the importance of only buying a business when it trades at a large discount to its fair value. In other words, they stress the importance of buying a business or stock only when it's selling with a large margin of safety in its price. How to pick high quality value stocks like Buffett and Munger. Most of us will never possess the investment acumen of Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, but the good news is that we don't need to. These two amazing men are in a class by themselves when we consider their skills or abilities as businessmen and capital allocators. They have built Berkshire Hathaway into the eighth largest public company in the world, with total assets approaching $900 billion and a net income of $42.5 billion in 2020. Luckily for us, Buffett and Munger have been unselfish in their sharing of their knowledge on how we can become much better investors and achieve a high level of success that the majority of investors fail to achieve. Throughout the years, Buffett and Munger have repeatedly told us that we can succeed in stock market investing and have shared their investment methodology with us through various mediums, such as interviews, lectures, videos, television appearances, annual shareholders meetings, and other media. Their investment methodology has resulted in them being the most successful investment partnership in history. I've learned over the years that simplicity is the key to great investing. You will find that most of the principles and strategies that Buffett and Munger use and teach are not complex. They tend to be simple, yet effective. Perhaps one of the major reasons most investors don't do well in the stock market is because they cannot accept the fact that simplicity beats out complexity when investing in stocks. According to research, the following four major tenets are the basis from which all of Buffett's and Munger's other principles and other criteria originate. Number one, invest in businesses that are simple and easy for you to understand. Buffett and Munger only invest in businesses that they understand or that they often refer to as being within their circle of competence. They recommend that individual investors do the same. I would never buy a business with the intent to run it of which I have no understanding. Why should picking stocks be any different? Number two, the business needs to possess favorable long-term prospects. When we're considering stocks to purchase, it only makes sense to look at companies that we know will be around for the long term. I'm talking about 20 years or more. Which do you think will still be in business even 10 years from now if you're familiar with both of them? Walmart or Kmart? You may be saying, Kmart? What's that? Yes, Kmart was a very popular and thriving company many years ago, but that's no longer the case. Most of its stores have been closed permanently. Yet it's still in business as I write this chapter, but for how much longer? According to my research, there were only 27 stores remaining at the end of 2021. 
Number three, the business needs to be run by capable and trustworthy management. Buffett or Munger can only be in one place at a time. However, Berkshire Hathaway has around 360,000 employees. The only way Berkshire could have achieved the success it has while maintaining an excellent reputation is through the use of capable and trustworthy management. And number four, a satisfactory margin of safety must exist in the selling price of the business. A good business is only a good investment if it can be purchased at a fair price. When we purchase shares in a stock, we're really buying partial ownership of the business. Two of the initial questions that we should ask if we were interested in the purchase of a business is how much does it cost and how much is it worth? Next, we will look at the criteria that I use to identify those high quality value stocks that Buffett and Munger would probably like. If we were to select stocks that possess the fundamentals and qualities that they favor, we're bound to improve our stock picking skills. Bearing that in mind, my investment criterion for identifying those high quality value stocks is as follows. Companies with at least a 10 year history of consistent operations, non-commodity type companies with a strong brand and or franchise, companies with little to no debt, meaning those that usually possessed a total debt to equity ratio of 0.5 or less. Companies that possess financial strength and staying power. Look for a current ratio of 1.5 or greater as proof of financial strength. Companies with returns on equity or ROE that are steady or growing. Look for a five year average return on equity of 12% or greater. Companies with strong and persistent records of earnings per share, or EPS, growth. This means that the company has managed to grow its EPS at an average annual rate of 10% or more over the last 7 to 10 years. Companies with stable or growing net profit margins. And companies that have produced ample free cash flow. Here, look for companies that have achieved a positive cash flow for every year during their most recent 5-year period. Now, not every company you find will meet all of the criteria listed. Sometimes the industry or sector in which a company operates has a big impact on its financial position or strength. So there are exceptions to the criteria that have been presented. But for the new or inexperienced investor, it would be better to only consider investing in companies that meet all the criteria that was explained. The Stock Screener when it comes to trading or investing, things can get a little complex and or aggravating, especially when it comes to picking the right stocks for your portfolio. Consider the fact that there are three major stock exchanges in the United States with no less than 2,400 stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange alone, and each of those companies is different in their makeup. For example, their business prospects, their employees, their facilities, and their finances will be very different. And this only complicates the matter for investors or traders. Don't forget, we haven't even included the companies that trade on the other two major exchanges here in the United States. Now, if that's not enough to make picking stocks more complex, I don't know what is. The stock screener is a very important tool in my arsenal for wealth creation. A stock screener is a very powerful investment tool that scans a database to search for stocks that meet certain criteria which have been specified by an investor or trader. The main components of any screener are a database of companies, stocks, a set of variables, and a screening engine that functions much like a search engine on the internet. Screeners may vary from being very simple and basic to much more complex. However, good screeners will allow you to search for companies using just about any criterion that's desired. Stock screeners may be standalone software programs or web-based programs. I use only the free web-based screeners, and I think that some of them are excellent, and several of the web-based screeners are free to use. With stock screeners, traders and investors are capable of analyzing hundreds of stocks in a very short time. This same process of analyzing stocks usually would have taken days or even weeks to perform before stock screeners were available, and that's no exaggeration. I now greatly depend on stock screeners when I perform my research, and I wouldn't want to be without them. 
without the use of stock screeners. Searching for stocks that meet the stringent criteria that I require can be compared to searching for a needle in a haystack. Remember, just on the exchanges in the United States, there are thousands of stocks. Stock screeners save time by eliminating those companies that do not meet an investor's or trader's requirements. A stock screener will generate a list of stocks that will need to be further studied and is merely the first step, but it is a very important step since it filters out stocks that don't meet your required criteria and creates a list of stocks that do. Several years ago, I used several different screeners to perform my searches, but I found that using that process wasn't very helpful and it created more work for me in the end. Now, I use only one or two screeners, and I've discovered along the way that investors or traders don't need more than one or two good screeners for research. Because each screener's different, the search parameters will vary somewhat. Once you have run a stock screener, you'll probably generate a large number of stocks that require additional research based on your investment program and or strategies to quickly weed out those stocks that do not belong on your list. The FinViz Screener The FinViz Stock Screener is an online browser-based stock screening tool that allows users to screen for stocks using a wide variety of descriptive, fundamental, and technical filters. The FinViz platform offers free and premium tools that traders and investors can use to generate stock investing ideas. The FinViz screener can be applied to many different trading or investing strategies and is a very useful tool for both new and experienced traders and investors. With a little familiarization, most users will find the FinViz platform to be user-friendly. The platform provides a sector performance tool, portfolio tracking, various charts and graphs, and numerous other features which users may find valuable. I use the FinViz screener to assist me with fundamental analysis, but I think the screener is an excellent choice for those desiring to perform technical analysis as well. The FinViz screener contains approximately 7,700 stocks in its database. In addition to stocks, users can analyze specific sectors or indexes. Users should be aware that quotes received through the FinViz platform are delayed 20 minutes for the New York Stock Exchange, or NYSE, and the American Stock Exchange, or Amex, and are delayed 15 minutes for the NASDAQ Stock Exchange unless users purchase the premium services offered by FinViz. First-time users can use the FinViz website without being required to log in or sign up to use the website, but they will only have access to the website's basic features. To access the more advanced features, the user must register on the website, which is a very simple and quick process. Users can also sign up for FinViz's Elite Plan, which is the paid version. With it, users gain access to premium features not available to free or registered users. The FinViz screener is my favorite screener, and the one that I mostly rely on during my research. The simple fact that I've become accustomed to using the FinViz screener to do most of my research has made me somewhat biased, and in favor of it in comparison to other screeners that I've used. Using the FinViz screener to find high-quality value stocks. Regardless of the investment style or strategy that I'm using, the FinViz stock screener is my favorite screening tool to use during my search. To use the FinViz screener, you simply select or enter your desired criteria into the different filters available in the screener. The FinViz screener contains predefined selections for the filters, and it's up to you to select the criteria that you desire companies to meet. To give you an idea of how the FinViz screener works, Go to the FinViz screener and enter the search criteria provided in the table to see what stocks, companies, the screener retrieves. Then, you can enter your own specific criteria that you want stocks to meet. It's as simple as that. My value stock screen is actually the same screen as the Buffett and Munger stock screen talked about in my book 100 Stocks That a Young Warren Buffett Might Like. My aim with this stock screen is to identify stocks that meet the characteristics that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger might seek during their stock selections. Buffett and Munger like to purchase high-quality companies that possess a durable competitive advantage. They like to avoid companies that have a lot of long-term debt. 
The return on equity is also an important metric that they take into consideration when looking for what they refer to as a wonderful company at a fair price. Because Buffett and Munger have so much money to invest, they tend to look mostly at companies that have large market capitalizations of several billion dollars. Berkshire Hathaway's cash position routinely stands at more than $130 billion. Since we don't have that problem, I've lowered the market capitalization to companies that have market capitalizations of $300 million or greater. So, specifically in the high-quality value stock screen, here's what I'll enter. Country, USA. Current ratio, 1.5 or greater. EPS growth rate over the past five years, 10% or greater. Debt to equity ratio, less than 0.5. Share price, $10 or greater. Return on equity over the past five years, over 15%. Operating margin, over 15%. P to E ratio, 20 or less. And finally, market capitalization, $300 million or greater. Remember, the screener will generate a list of stocks that will need to be further studied and is merely the first step. But it is a very important step since it filters out stocks that don't meet your required criteria and creates a list of stocks that do. Screeners and stock screening should never be used as substitutes for performing your research. The stocks retrieved by a screener or screening tool should not be considered a buy list. But a thorough financial analysis should be performed on every stock before determining whether or not to purchase them. Keep in mind that the screening criteria that's been presented here is my own, and it's up to you to decide what criteria is needed based on your own investing program or on the value investing criteria that was explained to you a little earlier. Once you begin to create your own customized screens with the FinViz stock screener, you can save those screens so that when you decide to perform stock research at a later date, you only have to log into your FinViz account and pull up the screen that was saved along with all of the required search criteria. Using the P to E ratio to estimate a value stock's trading price. When I'm trying to determine what to pay for a stock or other types of securities, I will always use two valuation methods and recommend that you always use at least two valuation methods too. Using at least two valuation methods will provide us with a specific price range to consider before purchasing a stock. For example, one valuation method may estimate a stock to be worth $20 per share, and another method may estimate that the same stock is to be worth $24 per share. By taking both methods into consideration, I'm able to conclude that the stock is worth between $20 and $24 per share. I see no need to use more than two methods if you have a great measure of confidence in those methods. First, we will look at how to use the price to earnings ratio, usually just referred to as the P to E ratio, to help us place some value or price on value stocks. In addition to my liking the P to E ratio, many stock market pros rely on the P to E ratio as an important and vital investment tool and have achieved amazing success through its use. The P to E ratio is also a very useful measure for determining if a stock is overvalued or undervalued, expensive or cheap relative to the stock market as a whole, or relative to other stocks within the same industry or sector, and if a stock is expensive or cheap relative to its historical trading prices. When using the P to E ratio, you should use the long-term average annual P to E ratio for better and more accurate estimates of a stock's trading price. When we use the P to E ratio in the manner that's being shown here, we are not determining a stock's intrinsic value, but we are seeing historically what investors were willing to pay for a specific stock based on its EPS estimates and we're estimating the price they're likely to pay now or at some point in the future. Anytime the term long term is used throughout this book, I'm referring to a period of seven to 10 years or longer. Now, let's take a look at a few examples of how to use the P to E ratio to estimate a stock's trading price. We will look first at automatic data processing, a provider of cloud-based human capital management solutions worldwide. The following table shows the average annual P to E ratios that automatic data processing traded for from 2011 through 2020. 
So let's sum it all up. The automatic data processing, or ADP PDE ratios from 2011 to 2020 were as follows. 2011, 21.0. 2012, 20.4. 2013, 28.3. 2014, 26.2. 2015, 28.3. 2016, 30.8. 2017, 29.7. 2018, 33.8. 2019, 31.4, and 2020, 31.1. We must first determine the total of the P to E averages by adding the values given for all 10 years from 2011 through 2020. Once we have the total, we divide it by 10 to obtain our long-term average annual P to E ratio. The equation for automatic data processing is as follows. 281 which is the sum of the P to E averages, divided by 10, the total number of years, equals 28.1. This is the long-term average P to E ratio. Analysts estimate that automatic data processing will earn $5.64 in 2021, and the stock traded at $179.24 per share at the time of this analysis. To estimate the stock's trading price using the P to E ratio, you multiply the estimated EPS for 2021 by the long-term average P to E ratio. The equation thus would be as follows. $5.64, the 2021 EPS estimate, times 28.1, the long-term average P to E ratio, to equal $158.48, estimated trading price. So based on what investors were willing to pay in the past for automatic data processing shares, the share should now trade for about $158.48 instead of the $179.24 that the shares trade for, meaning that automatic data processing shares are overvalued and trading at almost 14% higher than investors have been willing to pay in the past for its shares based on its estimated EPS. So I would not buy automatic data processing at its current trading price of $179.24, but I would wait for the shares to fall to a more reasonable price before buying them. Let's now look at ABV Inc. to estimate its trading price from the use of the PDE ratio. Its average annual PDE ratio history is contained in the following stretch from 2012 to 2020. In 2012, the PDE was 10.2. In 2013, 18.5. 2014, 28.5. 2015, 34.6. 2016, 16.9. 2017, 23.5. 2018, 19.1. 2019, 39.0. And 2020, 22.5. So when we add the average annual PDE ratios up for the year shown, we find that their sum is 212.8. And we will need to divide the sum by the number of years for which the average annual PDE ratios were supplied, which is 9 to obtain the long-term average PDE ratio. So the equation for ABV Inc. goes as follows. 212.8, the sum of the PDE averages, divided by 9, the total number of years, equals 23.6 for the long-term average P to E ratio. Analysts estimated that ABV Inc. would earn $12.22 per share in 2021, and the stock traded at $104.39 per share at the time of this analysis. To estimate the stock's trading price using the P to E ratio, Multiply the 2021 estimated EPS of $12.22 by the long-term average PDE ratio of 23.6. The equation would be as follows. $12.22, the 2021 EPS estimate, times 23.6, the long-term average PDE ratio, which equals $288.39 as the estimated trading price. So based on what investors were willing to pay in the past for ABV Inc., shares should be trading for about $288.39. But they were trading at $104.39 at the time of this study, which means that ABV Inc. shares were trading for much less than investors have been willing to pay for its shares in the past based on its EPS estimates. 
The shares are trading for about 176% less than the estimated trading price of $288.39. So I would take a serious look at AbbVie and consider adding shares of that stock to my portfolio. As you can see, the P to E ratio, and more specifically, the average annual long-term P to E ratio, is a very useful measure for estimating a stock's trading price. And it's easy to use. Using MoneyChimp's Graham-style formula to estimate a stock's fair value. Benjamin Graham is without a doubt one of the most influential and intelligent investors to have ever lived. It's the knowledge that he shared with his students that has resulted in them achieving the amazing success that they have. Graham was continuously searching for a better way to quickly and easily place a value on a stock or company, and created many formulas for just that purpose. In his book, The Intelligent Investor, Graham provides a formula for determining the value of growth stocks, and the formula is commonly referred to as the Graham Formula. Now, I know that this book's about value investing, but hear me out. As a value investor, we are really looking for high-quality value stocks with plenty of growth left in them. I will go a little further by saying we're looking for high-quality value stocks to invest in that possess the traits of growth stocks, such as increasing sales and increasing revenue. It has been said by some successful value investors that value and growth are joined at the hip. I like the fact that the Graham formula is simple to use. Because the formula was developed a long time ago, it tends to provide valuations that are very high by today's standards. There's no doubt that the original formula worked for Graham, but because so much with the economy has changed since his days as an investor, MoneyChimp.com experts found it necessary to make a modification to the original formula to bring modern stock valuations into what appears to be a more reasonable valuation range. So here's the original Graham formula. Value equals current earnings times the total of 8.5 plus twice the expected annual growth rate. Now, since I don't use the original formula, I won't go into details to explain it here. The modified formula that I adopted from MoneyChimp.com produces more conservative valuations than Graham's original formula, and it's the actual formula that I use. I have found it to be very effective in helping me to determine the value of high-quality value stocks. I've been using the modified formula for a long time, and I think that it's an excellent tool when it comes to valuing both high-quality value stocks and growth stocks. The modified formula that I use is as follows. P to E equals 9 plus the total of 0.5 times the growth rate, or fair value equals 9 plus the total of 0.5 times the estimated earnings per share growth rate. I'm going to show you how I use the preceding formula, and it's worked very well for me. Let's look first at CVS Health Corporation, or CVS. CVS Health Corporation stock is currently trading for $80.22 per share. It has managed to grow its earnings per share, or EPS, at an annual rate of 10.6 from 2016 to 2020. And analysts estimate that it will grow its EPS at 4% annually over the next five years. Analysts also estimated that CVS Health Corporation will earn $7.66 per share in 2021. Here's what the Graham-style formula from MoneyChimp.com would look like with those figures plugged in. P to E equals 9 plus the total of 0 0.5 times the estimated EPS growth rate. So that breaks down to P to E equals 9 plus the total of 0.5 times 4, which is 9 plus 2 which means P to E equals 11. So after the P to E has been determined for a stock, multiply the P to E by the estimated EPS for 2021. So it'll be as follows. $7.66, which is the 2021 EPS estimate, times 11, which is the Graham formula P to E, which equals a fair value of $84.26. With CVS Health Corp currently trading for $80.22 per share and its fair value estimated to be $84.26 per share, we can see that the company is trading slightly below its fair value. 
let's evaluate Cavco Industries. Upon checking, we find that Cavco Industries is currently trading for $215.83 per share. Cavco Industries has managed to grow its earnings per share at an annual rate of 33% from 2017 to 2021, and analysts estimate that it'll grow its EPS at an annual rate of 30% over the next five years. Now, anytime analysts provide EPS estimates above 20%, I'm going to limit my estimates to 20%, and I feel that doing so adds an extra measure of safety, since fast-growing stocks tend to fall hard in price if they fail to perform as expected. Analysts also estimate that Cavco Industries will earn $9 per share in 2022. So here's the result of the Graham-style formula from MoneyChimp.com with those figures plugged into it. P to E, remember, that equals 9 plus the total of 0.5 times the estimated EPS growth rate. So 9 plus the total of 0.5 times 20, which is 10. So 9 plus 10 equals a PDE of 19. So therefore, $9, which is the 2022 EPS estimate, times 19, which is the Graham formula PDE, equals a fair value of $171. So with Cavco Industries currently trading for $215.83 per share and its fair value estimated to be $171 per share, we can clearly see that Cavco Industries is an overvalued stock that needs to come down quite a bit in price before we would consider purchasing it. Finally, let's look at Lithia Motors using this method. Upon checking, we find that Lithia Motors is currently trading for $344.99 per share. The company has managed to grow its earnings per share by 27.7% from 2016 to 2020, and analysts estimate that it will grow its EPS by 15.9% over the next five years. Analysts also estimate that Lithia Motors will earn $23.42 per share in 2021. So, here are the calculations for Lithia Motors. Remember, PDE is 9 plus the total of 0.5 times the estimated EPS growth rate. So 9 plus the total of 0.5 times 15.9. So we'll estimate that at 8. And that brings us to a total PDE of 17. 9 plus 8. Now let's take that to the next step. $23.42, which is the 2021 EPS estimate, times 17.0, which is the Graham formula PDE, results in a fair value estimate of $398.14. With Lithium Motors currently trading for $344.99 per share, and its fair value estimated to be $398.14 per share, we find that the stock is undervalued by $53.15 per share, or 13.3% per share. I love using MoneyChimp's Gram-style formula when estimating a stock's fair value, and I think that the formula is simple to use and very reliable when used to value high-quality value stocks. MoneyChimp.com is an amazingly informative website, and I highly recommend that you visit it. The site also contains many other useful tools that I bet you'll find of great value, such as the Compound Interest Calculator that lets you figure out different growth rates. MoneyChimp.com has surely made investing a lot easier for me, and without any cost to me. Before you buy any stock. Because news and information today is so easily accessible, there's absolutely no excuse for not checking to see what important events are currently happening within any company whose stock shares we're interested in purchasing. This check should always be performed before buying shares of any company because it might just keep us from investing in the wrong company or investing in a company at the wrong time. I'm going to list several crucial news items that should concern you as an investor if the news has been reported to the public. If you learn that a company is involved or has become embroiled in any of the events detailed, your best course of action would be to put off buying the company's stock until you have thoroughly investigated the information. If the reported news is found to be true, you have the responsibility of determining from what you have learned if the stock is worth purchasing or if you should move on to look for something better and with less risk. So here's a list of news events that you should always investigate before buying the company's stock. 
executive officers, such as the CEO or the chief financial officer, CFO, quitting or being fired. Charges or accusations of corruption rallied against the company's key personnel. Financial auditors quitting or being fired. Executive officers reported to be selling large quantities of their company stock. Announcements concerning an ongoing investigation of the company by federal or state officials. The majority of board members are being replaced or fired, or quitting. Accusations of fraudulent accounting or other types of fraud being announced. Excessive compensation packages received by key personnel, despite the business steadily losing money. Large numbers of institutional investors reportedly selling their shares of the company's stock. Whistleblowers coming forward with information that could damage the company and its reputation. The company announcing that it will be issuing new shares to raise funds. And, of course, reports or announcements of buyouts or hostile takeovers of the company. Now, this list is far from all-inclusive. It is your responsibility as an investor to stay alert. In the business world, circumstances can change quickly, and you must be able to change or adjust to those changes to be a very successful investor. By staying abreast of the most recent news, you will, at the very least, be up to date with the company's most recent activities. I believe that a news check will help you to avoid buying some bad investments or investments that are about to turn bad. For me, one bad investment is one too many. Using Limit Orders and Market Orders The number one priority of any value investor is to purchase a security or business when it can be bought at a value price that has been determined in advance by the investor. Purchasing the security or business at the determined price is essential for the value investor, since the estimated total return of the investment depends on the price paid for it. So it is very important for the value investor to buy his or her security at the determined price or at a lower price. Although there are several types of buy and sell orders available to investors, there are only two types that the value investor needs to be concerned with, and they are market orders and limit orders. We will look at both types of these orders here. A market order is defined as an order to buy or sell a stock at the best available price. With market orders, the order is generally executed quickly. But the drawback is that the price at which a market order will be executed is not guaranteed. In other words, when using market orders, it is possible to pay more for a stock that you're buying or receive less for a stock that you're selling than you planned. If there's a sudden drop or rise in the stock market, money orders can be impacted dramatically. For example, let's suppose that you place a market order to buy a certain stock when the stock market opens because it closed on the previous day at a trading price of $30 per share. Before the market opens, the company reports better-than-expected earnings and revenue, resulting in the stock immediately rising to $40 per share at the market's opening. And guess what? There's a very high probability that you'll end up paying $40 per share for stock that you were planning to purchase for $30 per share, resulting in you paying 33% more for the share than you had originally planned. Selling can work the same way. The market falls dramatically upon opening, and your shares are sold for a lot less than you had desired. That's the danger that comes with using market orders. A limit order is defined as an order to buy or sell a stock at a specific price or better. The drawback to using limit orders is that they can only be filled if the stock market's price reaches the limit price, and the number of shares desired are available for purchase. The advantage of using limit orders is that they prevent an investor from paying more than he or she desires for a stock being purchased, and guarantees that he or she will receive the price desired or a better one for the stock that's being sold if the trade executes. Since value investing is intelligent investing, I believe that those using a value investing strategy should use limit orders when buying and selling stocks because of the fact that the value investor should only buy or sell a security when it meets the predetermined price. With limit orders, you won't pay more than you want to for a security or sell it for less than you desire. 
It's hard to kick against the use of limit orders when using a value investing strategy. When to sell a value stock. Famous investor Philip A. Fisher stated, quote, If the job has been correctly done when a common stock is purchased, the time to sell it is almost never. Warren Buffett has said that his favorite holding period for a stock is forever. And the point that he was making is that you should always purchase a stock with the intention of holding it forever. Therefore, make sure your money has been put into your best investment ideas. I have written eight investment books as of now, including the one that you're currently reading, but the information that I've provided about determining when to sell a stock has not changed much since my first book, and it's not likely to change anytime soon. Author Robert Hagstrom has written several excellent books about Warren Buffett and his investment strategies. In The Warren Buffett Portfolio, he says that an investor should leave his or her portfolio intact for at least five years, as long as the fundamentals for which a particular stock was purchased do not deteriorate. He also says investors should pay no attention to a stock's price volatility because it's a normal part of the investment cycle. In their book, Million Dollar Portfolio, the Motley Fool team says investors' minimum holding period for each stock that's purchased should be three to five years. As a long-term investor, there will be times when it makes sense to sell or reduce your position in a stock earlier than you had planned. Next, we will talk about different circumstances in which you should consider selling a stock or reducing your position in a stock. Starting with the time frame. If you'll need the money within five years, it should not be invested in stocks. It would be best to invest your money in safe and stable short-term instruments. Money market accounts, money market funds, and short-term certificates of deposits would be better options. Since the Great Recession struck, some investment professionals now recommend that you do not invest any money in stocks that will be needed within 10 years. An overvalued stock. When the stock is significantly overvalued, sell it. Take the proceeds from the sale and invest them into other undervalued stocks that you have researched. The PDE ratio is still one of the best indicators of value. For example, if a stock has traded at an average PDE of 15 for the last 7 to 10 years and the business is thriving, but the stock currently trades at a PDE of 30 or more on consistent or increasing EPS, well, then you should seriously consider selling the stock. We can also use the Graham formula explained earlier to determine if a stock is overvalued or undervalued. I must admit I'm slow to sell an overvalued stock if it's not extremely overvalued, because excellent investment choices are hard to find. And if they're in my portfolio, it's because I consider them to be excellent selections. When a stock is overvalued by 50%, I would not hesitate to sell it quickly in order to put my money into other investments that are better values. Too much debt. Too much debt is dangerous for any business because there's always the chance that a business may be unable to pay its debt. Too much debt also puts a business at greater risk of failure if a downturn in the industry or economy were to occur. Upon entering the 2007 recession, thousands of businesses here in the United States literally disappeared overnight. And that was before things really got bad. I'm willing to bet that those businesses that were carrying too much debt were the first to go. Now, I still like to refer to the debt-to-equity ratio when it comes to debt. I also like companies to be able to pay off their long-term debt in five years or less based on their net income for the most recent 12-month period. For example, a company has a long-term debt of $850 million and a net income of $125 million for the most recent 12-month period. By dividing the long-term debt of $850 million by the net income of $125 million, we get an answer of 6.8, or 6.8 years, which tells me that the company carries more long-term debt than I like. Remember, try to stick with 5.0 years or less, unless the company is some type of financial institution, such as an insurance company or bank. With such companies, don't be too concerned about long-term debt because it's normal for them to carry a lot of it.
too much risk. Sometimes new management will come to a business and begin to implement new policies. Along with that implementation, they will knowingly or unknowingly expose a business to greater risk. If you purchase the stock of a business that stays away from very risky practices, but now the business begins to display risky behaviors that make you uncomfortable, sell the stock and find yourself a better investment. Loss of competitive advantage. We should only purchase the stocks of businesses that have a durable competitive advantage. When a company changes its business model, resulting in it losing its competitive advantage, sell the stock. Having a durable competitive advantage is essential to any stock that we purchase as value investors. The return on equity is still a strong indicator as to whether or not a company has a competitive advantage in its industry. The portfolio lacks balance or diversification. It's very easy for your best performing stock to become the largest holding in your portfolio, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem arises when the stock makes up more than 20 to 25 percent of your portfolio's total value. I would be very uncomfortable having more than 25 percent of my portfolio's value tied to just one stock. Legendary investor Jim Slater suggests that individual investors limit the number of funds invested in a single stock within their portfolios to a maximum of 15%. When your portfolio becomes heavily weighted in one stock, consider reducing your position of that stock to bring more balance and better diversification into your portfolio. Stock reaches its fair value. Our goal as investors should always be to purchase a stock at a discount to its fair value, and I recommend at least a 25% discount to its fair value. By doing so, when you sell a stock that has reached its fair value, you are guaranteed a gain of at least 25% from the sale. This is a disciplined approach to selling a stock. According to research, it was common for Benjamin Graham to sell a stock once it had a 50% gain in price. If the future prospects of a particular stock look good, you may decide to sell only a portion of the stock, such as half of its shares, and hold on to the rest when using this approach. And finally, when your analysis is found to be flawed. There will be times when an investor will be very detailed and careful in his or her analysis of a particular company or its stock, only to find out later that his or her analysis is incorrect or flawed. Whether a stock should be sold at that time depends on the seriousness of the error and its impact on the long-term performance of the business. When you find that you have incorrectly analyzed a particular business, it is essential for you to take a serious look at all available information to determine whether or not to sell the stock or to continue holding it. One thing is certain. As an investor, you will not always be right when analyzing a company or its stock. Now, I've not discovered a clear-cut way to determine the optimal time to sell a stock, and I don't think even the best investors have figured that out. There will be times that you will sell a stock because it has not performed well, only to see it skyrocket and double or triple in price soon after you sell it. There will also be occasions when you've purchased what seems to be the perfect stock, only to watch it tumble in price and for no apparent reason. Learn what you can from these events and move on. Even Peter Lynch, Jim Slater, and other great investors have sold stocks too early or too late. It's going to happen sometimes. 10 Great Value Stocks for the Long Run I'd like to start this chapter with a little disclaimer. The author or publisher is not engaged in rendering legal accounting, investment, or other professional services. Investing in stocks and the stock market involves varying degrees of risk, and there's no assurance that a specific stock, investment principle, or investment strategy will be profitable for an individual group or organization. Although the 10 stocks listed in this section may meet certain criteria set forth in this book, it's not a recommendation from the author or publisher to purchase or sell any of the stocks discussed herein. A stock's past performance does not guarantee similar future results. All information contained in this book was gathered from sources believed to be reliable, but neither the author nor the publisher can accept responsibility for its accuracy. 
The author or publisher specifically disclaims any responsibility for liability, loss, or risk, professional or otherwise, which is incurred as a consequence, directly or indirectly, of the use and application of any of the contents of this book. All financial data for the 10 stocks presented is accurate as of January 16th, 2022. Okay, let's start with number one. Bank of America Corporation, BAC. Bank of America Corporation is one of the largest financial institutions in the United States and one of the world's leading financial institutions. The company serves approximately 66 million consumers and small business clients, having approximately 4,300 retail financial centers. The company has four segments, consumer banking, global banking, global markets, and global wealth and investment management. The company serves clients throughout the United States, its territories, and 35 countries. The company was founded in 1784 and is headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. Bank of America has grown its earnings per share, or EPS, at an annual rate of 23.45% during its most recent five-year period and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 23.89% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual return on assets, or ROA, of 0.89% during the last five years. The company's 10-year average price-to-earnings, or P-to-E, ratio is 21.58, and its 5-year average P-to-E ratio is 13.98. Bank of America has a forward P-to-E estimate of 15.04 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 2.03. The company's market capitalization stands at $399.06 billion, with a per-share selling price of $47.91 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 1.75%. Number 2. CVS Health Corporation, or CVS. CVS Health Corp. is the largest pharmacy healthcare provider in the U.S., with more than 9,900 retail locations in 49 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. It also has more than 1,100 minute clinic locations in 33 states and the District of Columbia. CVS Health offers affordable health services, such as in-store dietitian counseling services, immunization services, medical examinations, physicals, and blood pressure testing. In addition, the company offers telehealth services and prescription delivery services that are thriving as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and should continue to do well once the pandemic's over. CVS Health Corp. was founded in 1892 and is headquartered in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. CVS Health Corp. has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 3.3% during its most recent five-year period, and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 5.71% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual return on equity, or ROE, of 10.91% during the last five years. The company's 10-year average PDE ratio is 18.79, and its 5-year average PDE ratio is 17.61. CVS Health Corp. has a forward PDE estimate of 12.83 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 0.79. The company's market capitalization stands at $139.05 billion, with a per-share price of $106.22 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 2.07%. Number 3. Foot Locker, Inc., or FL. Foot Locker, Inc. is a leading global retailer of athletically inspired shoes and apparel. The company operates through two segments, athletic stores and direct-to-customers. Foot Locker, Inc. operates approximately 3,000 athletic retail stores in 28 countries across North America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand under various brand names. Foot Locker, Inc. was founded in 1879 and is headquartered in New York, New York. Foot Locker, Inc. has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 5.84% during its most recent five-year period and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 39.21% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual ROE of 18.01% during the last five years. Foot Locker, Inc.'s 10-year average P-to-E ratio is 13.41 and its five-year average P-to-E ratio is 11.21. Foot Locker, Inc. has a forward P-to-E estimate of 6.65 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 0.17. Foot 
The company's market capitalization stands at $4.49 billion with a per share price of $43.38 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 2.77%. Number four, Global Payments Inc., or GPN. Global Payments Inc. is a leading provider of payment technology and software solutions, delivering innovative services based on customer needs. Global Payments' technologies, solutions, and employee expertise enable them to provide a broad range of products and services. The company's products and services are used by more than 3.5 million customers in more than 100 countries. Global Payments, Inc. was founded in 1967 and is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. Global Payments, Inc. has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 18.85% during its most recent five-year period, and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 20% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual ROE of 15.62% during the last five years. Global Payments, Inc.'s 10-year average PDE ratio is 47.68, and its 5-year average PDE ratio is 69.48. Global Payments, Inc. has a forward PDE estimate of 15.74 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 0.43. The company's market capitalization stands at $43.3 billion with a per share price of $150.55 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 0.66%. Number 5. Lithium Motors, Inc., or LAD. Lithium Motors, Inc. operates as an automotive retailer in the United States. The company offers various brands of new and used vehicles at approximately 210 locations in 22 states. The company operates through three segments, domestic, import, and luxury. Lithia Motors, Inc. also provides products and services such as vehicle financing, insurance products, warranties, and automotive repair and maintenance services. The company was founded in 1946 and is headquartered in Medford, Oregon. Lithium Motors, Inc. has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 23.1% during its most recent five-year period and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 20.9% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual ROE of 22.74% during the last five years. The company's 10-year average PDE ratio is 14, and its five-year average PDE ratio is 12.28%. Lithia Motors, Inc. has a forward P-to-E estimate of 8.22 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 0.84. The company's market capitalization stands at $9.21 billion with a per-share price of $306.98 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 0.46%. Number 6. Markle Corporation, or MKL. Markle Corporation, often referred to as a baby Berkshire, is a diversified financial holding company that underwrites specialty insurance products in the United States and throughout the world. The company operates through two underwriting segments, insurance and reinsurance. The company's Markle Venture segment owns an interest in a variety of industrial and service businesses unrelated to its specialty insurance business. The company also operates through a segment as an insurance and investment fund manager. Markle Corporation was founded in 1930 and is headquartered in Glen Allen, Virginia. Markle Corporation has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 5.9% during its most recent five-year period and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 14.07% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual ROA of 2.15% during the last five years. The company's 10-year average P-to-E ratio is 23.05, and its 5-year average P-to-E ratio is 21.41. Markle Corporation has a forward P-to-E estimate of 16.99 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 0.32. The company's market capitalization stands at $17.35 billion with a per-share selling price of $1,276.61 as of January 16, 2022. Markle Corporation currently does not pay a dividend. Number 7. Patrick Industries, Inc., or P-A-T-K. 
Patrick Industries, Inc. is a major manufacturer and distributor of building products and materials for the recreational vehicle, manufactured housing, and marine industries. In addition, Patrick Industries supplies a range of products to certain industrial markets, such as kitchen cabinets, office and household furniture, fixtures and commercial furnishings, and other industrial markets. The company sells its products to customers in the U.S. and Canada. Patrick Industries, Inc. was founded in 1959 and is based in Elkhart, Indiana. Patrick Industries, Inc. has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 30.79% during its most recent five-year period and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 9.5% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual ROE of 27.02% during the last five years. The company's 10-year average P-to-E ratio is 14.86, and its 5-year average P-to-E ratio is 14.37. Patrick Industries, Inc. has a forward P-to-E estimate of 7.69 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 1.57. The company's market capitalization stands at $1.83 billion with a per-share selling price of $77.02 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 1.71%. Number 8. Thor Industries, Inc., or THO. Thor Industries, Inc., through its subsidiaries, designs, manufactures, and sells RVs, recreational vehicles, and related parts. Thor Industries is the world's largest supplier of RVs, with over 50% market share for towables and more than 40% market share for motorhomes. The company operates through two segments, towable recreational vehicles and motorized recreational vehicles. Its RVs are sold through independent dealers in the U.S. and Canada. Thor Industries, Inc. had revenue of $12.3 billion in 2021. The company was founded in 1980 and is also based in Elkhart, Indiana. Thor Industries has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 13.45% during its most recent five-year period and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 13.5% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual ROE of 18.55% during the last five years. The company's 10-year average P-to-E ratio is 15.95 and its five-year average P-to-E ratio is 15.32. Thor Industries has a forward P-to-E estimate of 7.42 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 0.73. The company's market capitalization stands at $5.7 billion with a per-share price of $99.97 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 1.72%. Number 9. T. Rowe Price Group, Inc. or T-R-O-W, T. Rowe. T. Rowe Price Group, Inc. is a global investment management organization. The company offers a broad range of stock, bond, hybrid, and money market funds. It provides its services to individuals, retirement plans, financial intermediaries, institutional investors, and other institutions. The company has more than $1 trillion in assets under management, or AUM. T. Rowe Price Group, Inc. has clients in more than 45 countries worldwide. The company was founded in 1937 and is based in Baltimore, Maryland. T. Rowe Price Group, Inc. has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 16.6% during its most recent five-year period and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 12.2% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual ROE of 29.17% during the last five years. The company's 10-year average P-to-E ratio is 17.1, and its 5-year average P-to-E ratio is 15.46. T. Rowe Price Group, Inc. has a forward P-to-E estimate of 13.14 and a debt-to-equity ratio of zero. The company's market capitalization stands at $39.85 billion with a per-share price of $174.97 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 2.47%. And finally, number 10, Williams-Sonoma, Inc., or WSM. 
Williams Sonoma Inc. is a leader in the home furnishings category and one of the largest e commerce retailers in the United States. The company operates through two segments e commerce and retail. Williams Sonoma products include cookware, bath and storage, bedding, tableware, lighting, and furniture. Williams Sonoma currently operates 581 retail stores in the United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, Australia, and the United Kingdom and franchises its brands to third parties in a number of countries. Williams Sonoma products are also available to customers through catalogs and online worldwide. The company was founded in 1956 and is headquartered in San Francisco, California. Williams Sonoma Inc. has grown its EPS at an annual rate of 20.7% during its most recent five-year period, and is expected to grow its EPS at an annual rate of 14.7% over the long term. The company has achieved an average annual ROE of 30.27% during the last five years. The company's 10-year average PDE ratio is 17.1, and its 5-year average PDE ratio is 14.98. Williams Sonoma Inc. has a forward PDE estimate of 10.65 and a debt-to-equity ratio of 0. The company's market capitalization stands at $11.06 billion with a per share selling price of $147.04 as of January 16, 2022. The company currently pays an annual dividend of 1.93%. Hello, fellow investor. Thank you so much for reading Value Investing Made Simple. I hope you enjoyed reading the book as much as I enjoyed researching and writing it. It has been a delight to share the knowledge I have gained through almost two decades of research, study, and portfolio management. If you like the book and you have a minute to spare, please consider writing a review on the page or website from which you bought the book. Even if you didn't like it, I'd appreciate your feedback. I'll give you the link for Amazon in just one second, but in the meantime, thank you so much for reading my book. In Gratitude, James Patterson Jr. The Amazon link will be www.amazon.com slash review slash create dash review slash listing. And finally, before you go, make sure to check out these other books by James Patterson Jr. You can invest like a stock market pro. How to use simple and powerful strategies of the world's greatest investors to build wealth. Now that you can invest like a pro... More principles and strategies for building wealth like the world's greatest investors. Common sense investing with stock screeners. Make stock investing a safe bet with the right tools. 100 stocks that a young Warren Buffett might buy. Proven methods for buying stocks and building wealth like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Common sense investing with index funds. How to build wealth, achieve financial freedom, and outperform most amateur and professional investors without really trying. A Beginner's Guide to Growth Stock Investing. How to Grow Your Wealth and Create a Secure Financial Future with Growth Stocks. And then finally, A Beginner's Guide to Dividend Stock Investing. Achieve financial freedom and live off of dividends forever. About the Author James Patterson Jr. is a self-taught private investor and investment researcher that literally spent thousands of hours performing research to determine what does and doesn't work when investing in stocks and the stock market. He has put into practice what he has learned about investing using his own money and says that the investment strategies work, and they work very well. Patterson is a graduate of York Technical College with honors. He has also extensively studied courses in business administration while attending the institution and earned numerous college credits in the process. He also earned an undergraduate certificate in criminal justice with honors from Ashworth College. Patterson served four years in the United States Marine Corps, where he was meritoriously promoted twice and received an honorable discharge and good conduct award. He was recalled to active duty to serve during Operation Desert Storm and received the National Defense Service Medal as a result. He enjoys exercising and was a competitive powerlifter many years ago and took first place in the North Carolina State Powerlifting Championships in the 181-pound class. He now speed walks about every day and practices the martial art known as Haikido. He was born and resides in the beautiful state of South Carolina with his family.